for a lot of people living with gender dysphoria, it is literally a matter of life and death to be able to get those surgeries because many of our people struggle with suicidal ideation uh, because what they see uh, physically on their body and how they think of themselves, how they experience their gender is dissonant. And having those surgeries is the way uh, to have more alignment for who they truly are. Some people often question whether these surgeries are cosmetic or um, just superficial. Being told that their surgeries are postponed is just another um, instance of them having to live in that dysphoria place, that place of trauma, for that much longer. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. Did you know that viruses can be transphobic? I did not know that, but I'm glad that we have the mainstream news to keep us informed during a global crisis. I'm glad that CBS and NBC can take a break from complaining about it being called a Chinese virus to let us know that the worst part about the crisis isn't actually the economy collapsing or millions of jobs being destroyed or families being put into financial strain. It's actually that people can't mutilate their genitals anymore since our healthcare system apparently only cares about the needs of straight people or something like that. Basically, the idea, as you saw, you know, these gender affirming or sex alignment surgeries. These are life-saving procedures, so there's no reason for them to be put on hold as our healthcare system is overrun with coronavirus cases. Um, there's a pretty clear distinction between them, though, and that difference is that coronavirus treatment is like literally life-saving, and mutilating your genitals or having your breast tissue removed, that's not life-saving. Like, what they mean by that is, well, transgender people are very distressed and suicidal, and these surgeries help reduce that, uh, which makes them less suicidal, so it saves their lives. But the problem with that is that a life-saving procedure, by definition, is something that has to be done to prevent an individual from dying. That's why it saves their life. And it also implies that the death of the individual is something over which that individual has no control. But with these surgeries, it's just a hypothesis. It's just saying, well, if we perform this surgery on them, they may be less likely to commit suicide. But that's much different than a life-saving operation where if performed correctly, will basically guarantee that the individual will not die of that cause. These gender-affirming surgeries, you know, they used to be called sex reassignment surgeries, but then that was not inclusive enough. But these surgeries, even when done correctly, do not solve the underlying problems with gender dysphoric people or people with gender identity disorder. And even that aside, suicide, which is ultimately a choice, it's different than dying from other causes when you don't want to die. And some people might say, well, if you're smoking and you get lung cancer and you die, that was your choice in a way. And I get that, but I would say this in response, explicitly choosing death is much different than choosing things that result in death. Like you wouldn't look at a guy who's on a skyscraper and watch him jump off and then watch another guy try to push someone out of the way of the fallen guy, knowing that he's going to get hit and end up saving that person and then getting killed. Like you wouldn't look at those two dead men on the sidewalk and equate their intentions. The results were the same, but the actions of those two men were decidedly different. If you performed a surgery on someone to solve a problem, but they were still 19 times more likely than the general population to die after the surgery because of that very problem, you would not really call that a life-saving procedure. In fact, you would probably want to explore other treatment options, right? And some of you might be familiar with that study. The infamous Sweden study, the left says that it's bad data, and that's not true at all. But what is true is that a lot of times, the conclusions that people draw from this study are inaccurate. That study does not suggest whatsoever that undergoing the surgery is what causes these people to commit suicide. However, it does showcase that even when controlled for prior psychiatric illness, the likelihood of death by suicide for transgender people who had undergone the procedure was 19 times higher than the general population. And what this suggests is that these surgeries are not, in fact, life-saving. They seem to be pretty ineffective. The only way Way that they would be effective is if they brought transgender people down to about where the general population is. But that isn't what happens at all. And when the left, you know, they respond to this by saying, well, you know, of course they're still going to be treated poorly, which is going to make them suicidal. That is absurd. Frankly, can you show me where blacks living under Jim Crow were committing suicide at 19 times the rate of the white population or even higher? And if not, can you explain to me how you think that transgenders are treated worse than blacks under Jim Crow? What this ultimately will be traced back to is the underlying mental illness, which is that these people feel as if they are not their actual gender. 
And, you know, these surgeries, to call them gender-affirming is an absolutely Orwellian abuse of language, like this idea that you're going to physically alter the body, which exists objectively, so that it matches what the person thinks or what the person feels. And interestingly enough, both the body and mind exist as a direct result of your sex. So this idea that you can have a man's brain trapped in a woman's body literally makes no sense because the woman's body only developed into a woman's body because of the hormones secreted by her during development as a result of the absence of the SRY gene, and those hormones regulated the development of her body into a woman. Like, virtually every cell of her body is a female cell, and mutilating her body to give it the cosmetic appearance of a male body isn't going to change that. And I don't want to get in too deep with this because, you know, it really should be its own video. I say that a lot, but still. And I'm also going to be debating this at some point in the future with Hunter Avalon, uh, since he somewhat recently came out in support of transgenderism, so we'll get more into it then. He also divorced himself from the right a few days ago. I don't know. We've been trying to set something up, he and I, for a few months, so he's kind of hard to get a hold of. He's a dad now, so we'll be patient. I've spoken to him once or twice. He's always been very nice to me, except one time he did call me a cuck. But other than that, you know, I think that's more of like a branding thing for him, but, you know, that seems to be like what he does. So I didn't take it personally, but yeah, we're going to be nice to Hunter. We're looking forward to the debate, but uh, I, I do want to go through a couple articles here that I found so that we can kind of see how people are trying to use coronavirus to forward the transgender agenda. So I want to start with the Vice article because I think that that's going to really be the meat and potatoes of it. So the headline is, as hospitals prepare for COVID-19, life-saving trans surgeries are delayed. We already talked about what they mean by that, but it starts off by saying that though medical facilities may soon become overtaxed for everyone, the coronavirus pandemic has shed light on how transgender people's care can be treated as quote, non-essential, which we've already proven is basically true. But then it says, for transgender and gender non-conforming people, Gender-affirming surgeries are life-altering procedures which, for many, can greatly reduce gender dysphoria and improve their quality of life. Okay, cool. So they make a claim here, and they provide a source for it. They claim that these surgeries greatly reduce gender dysphoria and improve the quality of life of transgender people. The problem is that the information provided by the source that they're citing does not say that. They're citing an article which is talking about a study that was conducted in Sweden. And what that study found was the likelihood of an individual seeking mental health care, particularly for mood and anxiety disorders, after undergoing one of these surgeries. That is not at all the same as finding if the symptoms of the patient had decreased as a result of the surgeries. That is specifically finding if the patient was less likely to seek treatment for mood and anxiety disorders, which are related to gender dysphoria, and assuming that the reason that they would be less likely is because the surgery was successful. So they take mood and anxiety disorders, which are only parts of gender dysphoria. There's the first gap. And then they say that you can know the degree to which the symptoms have decreased because of the surgery by looking at the degree to which people have stopped seeking treatment for those specific symptoms that we mentioned earlier. And that assumes that everyone who is suffering from those symptoms as a result of being transgender will seek treatment for them. That's the second gap. So already the conclusion that they're drawing from this is incorrect. The methodology of the study literally makes it impossible to draw that conclusion. It's just simply not engineered correctly. Now, that aside, even if it were correct, even if the study were designed to be capable of honestly producing that conclusion, it's still not nearly as significant as they're claiming that it is. Because if you look at what they found, and I'll give you two pieces of information, and I'll explain what they mean in case you're not familiar with statistics. The AOR that they arrived at was 0.92. In statistics, the AOR is the adjusted odds ratio, and that's a ratio that controls for other predictive variables in a model. So for example, if we had an AOR of 1.5, that would mean that the odds of that thing happening are 1.5 times whatever the odds of the baseline were. So as a percentage, it would be like 50% more likely. So in this study, the AOR that they arrived at was 0.92. And what that implies within the context is that for every year following a reassignment surgery, individuals were 8% less likely to seek treatment for the disorders that we talked about earlier. 8%. We'll come back to that in just a second. But the second thing that I wanted to talk about is their confidence interval, which was between 0.87 and 0.98 at 95%. And basically a confidence interval is a way of displaying data within a range of values to be more precise. So all that that's saying is that we are this percent confident that the true value lies within this range. And the more confident you are, the greater your range is going to be, which isn't always helpful. So typically the rule of thumb is to have a 95% confidence interval, which just means that uh, when you're doing your calculations with the data, you'll always set your confidence interval to be at 95%. So with this study, they had a 95% confidence interval with values ranging from 0.87 to 0.98. And what that means is that they are 95% confident that the true number was between 0.87 and 0.98, which means that the true percentage decrease could be as high as 13%, but it could also be as low as 2%. Remember that the AOR implied 8% decrease. So that's what we'll go with. But 
What this means is that the effective best case scenario, according to their methodology, undergoing these surgeries only decreased the likelihood of a transgender person seeking this type of mental health care by only 13%. And the effective worst case scenario, it's only 2%. And with the safest number, which was the 8%, even that is not all that significant. Like, can you tell me of one other treatment where your symptoms would only decrease by 8% every year that we would still advocate as the best option for you? And remember, the Vice article said that these surgeries greatly reduce gender dysphoria. Does an 8% decrease constitute a great reduction? Absolutely not. And again, this is still assuming that their methodology was correct which it wasn't. All this proves is that transgender people sought marginally less mental health care than before, but not greatly less, and also it acknowledges that it was still significantly more than the general population. Does that sound like anything was solved? No. And the last thing, even that they sought less mental health care specifically for the things that we talked about earlier isn't in itself significant, because even if the decrease was 50%, it could be because of a multitude of different reasons. Maybe they couldn't afford it. Maybe uh, they didn't think it was helpful. Maybe they were experimenting with different options. Like These are all factors that could poke holes in something like a 50% decrease. But remember, we're just working with an 8% decrease. So the fact that Vice publishes this, and by the way, doesn't even link to the study. They just link to an article that talks about the study without getting into the specifics of it like we did. It's just grossly irresponsible reporting. And also, because remember, they claimed that it greatly reduced gender dysphoria and improves their quality of life. The problem with that is that there's virtually nothing in that study that mentions quality of life, which is something that you can actually measure, by the way. But you know, whoever published this article or whoever wrote this article is just trying to manipulate the perception that the reader has by just plugging it full of nice things with no basis in reality, which I guess is the core of leftism. But since there's nothing in this study that talks about quality of life, but the author insists on talking about quality of life, we can do that. There was a rigorous study done at the University Hospital and University of Bern in Switzerland that was published in 2009, and it looked at the quality of life of transgender people 15 years after their sex reassignment surgery. So they used a control group of women who had undergone at least one pelvic surgery, and they found that post operative of transsexuals reported lower satisfaction with their general quality of health and with some of the personal, physical, and social limitations that they experienced with incontinence that resulted as a side effect of the surgery. So as it would turn out, the quality of life isn't actually improving after the surgeries. There's also data from UCLA based on the National Transgender Discrimination Survey. And if you look at the lifetime suicide attempts for transgender people by the different types of health care that they've wanted or that they've had, what you find is that there's no statistically significant improvement or even worsening after many of these procedures or different treatments. So since the data is based on lifetime prevalence, you would want to compare the people who want it versus the people who have had it for each of the categories. And what you find is that there's no significant difference between these two groups, which implies that the effects of these treatments are marginal at best, which is basically what the Vice study told us. So this is actually like a pretty consistent conclusion. And I think that the rate at which people are attempting suicide is a better measure of their quality of life than how often they go for treatment for anxiety or mood disorders. And the suicide attempt rates imply that these treatments are not effective. So that's that. Look at us go. We got through one paragraph. Uh, So then the article goes on to say, this underscores a common experience amongst trans people seeking medical care or surgery. Research has suggested that gender affirming surgery in particular has a notable and long term impact on mental health. But far too often, trans people already wait far longer than is safe or healthy for this care. Further delays can be dangerous and even life threatening. Okay, so the citation that they provide for when they claim that it has a notable and long term impact on mental health is just a different article talking about the same study that we've already gone over. So that's invalid. But the rest of the paragraph speaks more to the theme of the whole article. Uh, which we're going to move on from because we've covered the gist of it. But what that theme is, is basically this idea that, you know, we can't delay these surgeries because without them, transgender people will die. So it doesn't matter that coronavirus is killing people. We still need hospitals to allocate resources to chopping off peepees. And that's a ridiculous proposition, but I do sympathize with it because, you know, you have to understand that these people are not mentally well and they're desperate and they're being told that the only thing that they can do to help them are surgeries like the ones we've talked about. And even though that's not true, it's still a desperate situation. But the reason that these procedures can and have to be delayed in situations of global catastrophe is that they are a elective procedures. And what that means is that they are not procedures done to solve a medical emergency. Cosmetic surgeries are elective surgeries. These reassignment surgeries are effectively cosmetic surgeries. There is no evidence to suggest that they improve quality of life. And in fact, there's even some evidence to suggest that they may make it worse. And there's no evidence to suggest that it makes transgender people less suicidal. We're not saying this because we don't care about transgender people. We are saying this because we want what's best for them. And what you're doing clearly is not working at all. The solution is not to entertain the delusion. The solution is to help them accept and live in alignment with reality. And that actually segues nicely into the next article that we're going to talk about. Uh, And this will be the last one because we've been going for a while. And I'm trying to keep these a bit shorter since they've been pretty long recently. But... 
I don't know. I, I always feel like I have a lot to say, so we'll find a balance. Maybe we'll do a podcast. But anyways, this is from BuzzFeed, and the headline is, Many trans students have been forced to hide their true selves because of college closures. The coronavirus pandemic has put the mental and physical health of an already vulnerable group at far greater risk. So I'm going to read the first part really quickly, uh, and then we'll talk about it. So it says, Nora didn't want to come home. When Michigan State University, where she is a senior, shut down because of the coronavirus, Nora's panicked parents brought her home. Back to rural Michigan, to an isolated house surrounded by woods and cornfields on all sides. It's a house where 21-year-old Nora, who is transgender, can't be herself. Where every day her parents call her by the wrong name, use the wrong pronouns, where she can't dress the way she wants, where she can't leave the house, not even to go to the pharmacy to get the medication she needs for her gender affirmation, which her parents don't know that she's taking. Nora, who asked that her name not be used in the story, isn't out to her parents. Quote, I've got a strong feeling that if I were to come out, she said, I would be swiftly disowned. It's dehumanizing, Nora said, not to be able to be herself, to be called every day by a name that isn't hers, even if it comes from a place of ignorance. Okay, so Nora is presumably a young man that identifies as a woman, and he hasn't told his parents about this yet. And that's the first thing that I think is important to point out, which is that he's talking about how his parents make his life terrible by calling him the wrong name, which by the way is just the name that his parents gave him upon him being born. Uh, they're calling him by the wrong gender, etc. But he also reveals that he hasn't even told his parents about his condition, nor has he told his parents about the medication that he's taking for that condition because he feels as though he would be disowned. And I guess I would have to call into question the justice of that because if you haven't even told your parents about your condition, how can you be upset if they're not addressing you how you would like to be addressed? And I think that what's actually happening here with this whole, you know, I'm afraid that I would be disowned, I don't really buy that. What it actually is probably is that the parents who very likely want what's best for their son would encourage him to live in alignment with his true biological sex. And I've done a video about uh, kids and transgenderism. You can go back and watch that so I'm not repeating everything here. But this is just not something that actually happens. Like the parents just reject them as if they're murderers and not just incorrect about the reality of their situation. Like give me a break, maybe in Utah, but as a Michigander myself, I find the story highly improbable. And the rest of the article is just more stories like this. You know, kids talking about how at college they can go live their truth and be themselves. But when they get home, they aren't accepted for who they really are. So I don't know if we really have to go through the whole thing. But what's interesting is that colleges and universities, which are supposed to be places that you go to learn and have your ideas challenged, are instead acting as safe havens for people to go to, typically on their parents' dime, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of dimes, by the way, and they're going there to indulge in these fantasies that have no basis in reality. It's like a quasi-Neverland. It's like a progressive 21st century Neverland. You can go there, you can indulge in all of these delusions, and the mean old Captain Hook keeps misgendering you, so you and the lost kids, because lost boys is outdated, you go get Captain Hook to check his privilege by having a trans person of color replace him in his position of authority on the ship, and then Smee comes out as non-binary or something. Like, that's the story. It's critically acclaimed, but... I think it's a very dangerous direction that we're heading in where kids don't have faith in their families. And I promised myself that we would get through one video without talking about the collapse of the family structure, but they have no faith in their families, let alone faith in God to look out for them or to have their best interests at heart. And so they go off to these schools and they learn a bunch of nonsensical concepts that have only existed for a couple decades about gender and sexuality and whatnot. And then they think that they know better than their parents. And then they think that their parents aren't actually looking out for them if they are not totally and completely accepting of whatever the child thinks. But but the most chilling line in the whole article I will share with you because I think that it speaks to the reality of the situation that we're in. It's a quote from one of the transgender kids who said, as soon as my folks let me leave, I'm headed straight to the pharmacy. And what that means is literally, my family can't help me, only chemicals can help me. My family doesn't know what's best for me, only drug companies and the gender ideologues that occupy academia know what's best for me. Don't listen to your parents. Don't listen to God. Just do whatever makes you feel good, like taking chemicals and playing Animal Crossing, because after all, you know best and are not at all influenced by the mental disorder from which you are suffering. So everything should be fine. Like, even though there's not a shred of evidence or even common sense, frankly, that would suggest that, that's what's so terrible about the coronavirus for these people. It's a reminder of what they hate, which is objectivity and the family. It's a reminder that, hey, sorry, but your condition does not really require those surgeries, so we're going to focus resources on fighting coronavirus, and it's also forcing them to be around their families and making them choose whether they would like to accept that their family knows better than them and better than their friends and better than their professors what is right for them, what is right for their child, and the uncomfortable reality of that would be 
that what they're currently doing is not right for them, which would mean admitting that their parents are correct. And as we said earlier, these people are in desperate situations. So we want to be sympathetic towards them, but we also want what's best for them. And what's best for them isn't telling them that they're correct in their delusions. In fact, that's actually harmful to them in the long run. So what is best for them is support from those close to them in coming to live in accordance with their true objective gender. Hey guys, if you like this video, just give me 30 seconds more of your time really quick. Won't take long. Leave a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Subscribe to the channel. Turn on notifications. That one's important, but like especially because they're all important. Uh, and then share the video with a friend. That's also especially important, but like tier two. Maybe if you do all those things, I'll even tell you the true meaning of this t-shirt. Is it the only clean white t-shirt that I had left? Maybe. Does it have something to do with what we talked about since this is like a like the, the female bathroom sign? Perhaps. Is it a protest of California sanding off literally the Venice skate park? Because this is a girl skateboard company t-shirt. Maybe. Perhaps it's a concoction of the three. Or perhaps it has no meaning. Perhaps it's abstract. Who knows? It's interpretive. But thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.